The following podcast is a discussion between two experts in their fields of beauty and not meant to be taken as medical advice. Be sure to consult with your doctor if you have any medical inquiries. by the head of uh, Restoration Robotics uh, Robotic Division, uh, Agi Petrovich. Um, we actually did a podcast uh, where we talked for like an hour and a half, two hours, um, and uh, kind of dived into a lot of the details about restoration uh, robotics and uh, why I think the artist is the top way of harvesting hair. Uh, so we're going to kind of focus our, our discussion today. Um, Agi, in case you don't know, is just amazing. He's been working with um, robotic hair for over 14 years. He is the director of the robotics R&D. So all those cool things that you're, you're interested about, what's coming in the future, what's going to happen. And uh, he knows, he knows more than actually any hair surgeon out there because he's working on the front end of the robotic end, end of this. Um, and so without further ado, Augie, we're just going to kind of jump in there. So first of all, congratulations for everything that uh, you've accomplished and, and achieved. And behind me is your... Latest accomplishment. This is the IX, Artist IX. Um, and That's so good. first, yeah. So first things first, let, let's go into it. Why the IX? Why did you change the platform? Because you already had a great device with the previous artist. So what was the need to switch to the IX? Uh, right. So, um, so first of all, thanks. Uh, thanks uh, so much for having me on your uh, program, Dr. Shah. So, um, the story about IX uh, begins uh, actually with the implantation. Um, at the time when we were, this was about uh, four years ago or so, when we were um, developing, we were starting to develop implantation, we were considering, you know, how do we integrate this new product into the um, ARDA system? And one idea was to just modify the 9X and add implantation to the 9X. Uh, another option was actually to create a completely new device just for implantation only. Um, and at the end, uh, we decided to actually update the 9X, uh, apply technology upgrades uh, and lessons learned uh, from the field and uh, create the, uh, that's how we got to IX system. Okay, and so um, now on these upgrades for the IX, what's what's different about it? So what, what can it do that the 9X, why did you switch platforms? Is it like, does it see better? Does it have better vision? Does it have more capability with its arm? Um... Yes, yes. So of course it can do implantation. And then uh, if you compare side by side, IX and 9, 9X systems, you can uh, immediately notice that the footprint of the IX system is uh, much smaller. And uh, that is uh, that makes it much more mobile. We decided to uh, make it more uh, easy, more portable. So uh, we integrated the touch screen uh, into the cart. So um, uh, it's, it's easier to, to move around. Um, we decided to make it, uh, make uh, the mechanism smaller um, or this is the end piece that actually harvests the hair. So it's easier to work around. Uh, the mechanism itself is uh, quieter. Um, we, uh, uh, we, we, made the, we made systems upgrade to use the uh, uh, quieter motors. Um, and then uh, we also um, uh, added new LED lights, which provide better illumination, uh, ultimately the better vision system too. And then of course the centerpiece is the new robotic arm, uh, which uh, replaces the old industrial, uh, uh, kind of more industrial looking arm with something that's already uh, qualified for medical use. So it's a medical grade robotic arm, uh, the top, top quality right now in the industry. You know, you know, I've had my hair done with both. I've had it done with the 9X and I've had it done with the IX. And some of the things that I've noticed is that with the IX, it, first of all, noticeably quieter, like you mentioned, but it also felt like it was, um, again, me being as a patient kind of back there, um, not that it was uncomfortable with the, the 9X, but it felt like maybe the touch was just a little bit gentler and more consistent. Um, and... Uh, I don't know. Is that is that true? And is it a different mechanism that's propelling the IX versus the 9X? Uh, yeah, yeah. So the the mechanism is smoother. Um, also, the arm itself has a larger reach, which allowed us to uh, uh, accommodate different uh, patient positions too. Uh, more comfortable uh, positions for the patient. Now, with the IX system, the patient can be uh, laying prone, uh, which is more more comfortable. 
which adds to the patient's experience of, about the whole procedure. Have you noticed a difference in precision though with the IX versus the 9X? I mean, to me, again, this is me as, as, as a doctor surgeon, um, it feels like the other one was more like an air driven. It was just kind of pushing through there versus this one feels like it, yeah. I think the dependence and feel, it feels different. And so I think that part feels like, is, is there more precision in that? Is that something I'm just reading into that? Uh, sure, sure. Yeah. So, uh, so first of all, both systems have excellent accuracy that uh, uh, we are known for as a company. Um, and the 9X system indeed does use air to propel the needle, uh, which makes this katank sound. Um, it's um, uh, it's it, uh, at the end of the stroke, you can kind of uh, hear it um, as as you end as the needle uh, finishes the stroke. And then, of course, uh, the impact with the uh, skin is uh, is a bit uh, is a bit gentler too. Yes. Okay, and then I think also it feels different in the back of the head. So is the spin mechanism, is the RPMs different in the IX versus the nine, or is it uh, the same? It feels, it feels a little bit different again. As right, a right. So, so the major upgrade that we released immediately with the IX is the, the punch itself. So we released the ultra punch, um, which, uh, um, uh, which is a bit sharper punch that we used to, to have. Um, however, uh, we, we have clinical data and we had great results and great feedback from the doctors that uh, the, our yield has improved. Um, and uh, that punch, I think, has a, a lot to do how, um, uh, how the actual dissection uh, process is perceived and how it pro uh, progresses. In addition to that, uh, we have also modified, uh, we have refined our uh, RPM, our, the way the punches are spinning. Uh, so we are now actually um, modulating the speed of the punch as it enters the skin. So that way um, we can uh, kind of glide in at the, uh, at the very top. It's very easy for punch to go in with a high RPM and then slow, we slow down so we don't damage the sensitive part of the follicle. Yeah, that, that's something I've observed because, I've, again, I've done this multiple ways. I've done it with handheld FUE, which, again, the right. biggest issue with handheld is... Um, uh, it wasn't necessarily an RPM issue, a start stop. It was, can you get your hand, can you get the angle and are you going to transect it? And, um, you know, the RPMs are going to be consistent. It's really hard with your foot to kind of turn on, turn off. Um, but that being said, I, again, the more and more I, I would look at my handheld FUE and, I, and I, I look at other doctors handheld FUE, the best case scenario you're going to get is 70% success. I thought the 9X was already just a huge quantum leap over that, the consistency of the graphs. But I feel, I didn't know that there was that much more room to get better, but I think for me, looking at the graphs, they were really consistent with the nine. It seems to be almost like identical when you're looking at each graph when they're coming out. And that, that consistency is just another level of, um, I guess the best word to describe that is robotic precision when you're looking at this. Oh you yeah, know? yeah, it, right. Right, so each, uh, for example, for each, uh, uh, each uh, follicle, um, we all, our centering is uh, guaranteed to be within 100 microns where the graph is. Okay, so that's you cannot achieve that by, by hand and also by just a couple of degrees or so uh, in terms of the angle. That's very hard to achieve uh, for, uh, by hand and the system and, um, gives you that for every single follicle. So let, let's talk about that. Let's dive into that a little bit. 100 yeah. microns, being as accurate as 100 microns. So yeah. a thousand microns is about a millimeter. A hundred microns is 0.1 millimeters of accuracy. That is unbelievably accurate. And again, um, my, 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 I wear lots of hats. Yeah, I'm not wearing a hat right now, but I wear lots of hats. But one of the things I do is search and I, and I, I wear loops of different magnification. The largest loops you can practically wear about 7X. There's no way you can be within 0.1 um, millimeters or hundred microns every time with your hand consistently with the exact angle and putting the right time to spin it with your foot pedal on the pedal and not, there's no way you can do that accurately enough. They can do it a few times, but they're not going to do it time after time after time and getting that consistency with an FUE. How accurately can the new IXC um, pair? What, what vision is it looking at? Yeah. So the actual camera um, accuracy is uh, 40 microns. Um, so typical follicles about uh, 100 micron uh, width, you know, um, uh, uh, above skin, it's about like a millimeter that's visible. 
Um, and uh, we present also to uh, users uh, on the on the screen that can also see the graphs and uh, that ma magnification is about 10x. Um, and uh, what uh, what that is useful for is, for example, as the dissection uh, proceeds, uh, maybe um, the doctor wants to see the graft and they can actually, uh, what, what we see is that the, um, you can extract the graft, just uh, lay down on the skin and then the camera can uh, ser uh, serve as a microscope. You can kind of see how the graphs look like. Um, um, do, do you need to change the angle? Um, um, do you see any transactions? And then basically um, uh, that we found that to be very uh, useful in certain cases. So correct me if I'm wrong. So all these parameters talking about changing it, this is me as, as an artist user. Yeah. Way back when, this is like four years ago, I found that I was changing the parameters a little bit more, looking at things and kind of having to right. like change it. I don't think I really changed much in the parameters because it seems like as the robot goes and does things, it seems like it's just like it's adapted. And after like the first grid, it's pretty perfect. Is that um, accurate? Not accurate what I'm saying. So, because for me looking yeah, at it- Yeah, we are know, done. I think we, we used to have probably about 10 parameters or so. So I think we're down to about three or four now. So, um, you know, one parameter is that we still allow users to control uh, the depth if they want to go deeper or shallower the, with the punch. Another important uh, a, uh, parameter is an angle. Um, so if um, um, if the user wants to, if the doctor wants to, to change the angle, for example, if somebody has more curly hair, yeah, uh, curly they can hair. adjust that. Um, and then of course, there's a parameter of how many hair do you want to take out? So, uh, uh, you know, basically the density of harvesting, that's the spacing uh, parameter. So that way you can control, you know, okay, on this patient, I, want, I need certain amount of graphs. Uh, it's a small case. I'm going to make the spacing larger. If it's a, if it's a, it's a big case, then uh, and a patient has enough density, then then uh, then you take more. Um, so those are our main parameters uh, changed by by the physician. Let's talk about that last parameter because this is something yeah. that I think is not emphasized enough. So um, uh, it's no secret that a lot of patients are wanting to do FUE, and FUE is the, it's the treatment of choice for hair transplantation. Uh, but the problem with that is what I'm seeing in my office is patients getting multiple, multiple treatments. And when you're looking at the back of the head, and I'm going to show you the back of my head, I've had two. Um, and if it's done right, and I've had it done with artists, if it's done right, you should not be able to tell, even when your head is like at a one guard, what's been harvested. And the problem I'm seeing is that these patients are getting these really obvious patterns where you can see where the hair was harvested. It was over harvested in one spot. You know, and it's so I think with the with the artists, it's basically I've never seen that in one of my patients is it, it's almost impossible to create these obvious hair patterns and over harvesting all that. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. So we have specific uh, specific logic to prevent uh, over harvesting. So that's uh, that's uh, one uh, one part of the system that we closely look look at, of course. Um, and um, in general, when you acquire, when you look at the back of the head with the system, uh, the camera will tell you the exact density of that area. So, um, so the physicians can adjust and say, hey, hold on, like uh, the actual density in this area is lower or higher, and then I, I might need to adjust a little bit. This is something I didn't know before. Yeah, and when I like, I, I adjust this during the case. For example, if I'm, I want yeah. someone with uh, mostly a front hairline, I might pick ones. Yeah. If I want someone with, um, you know, um, uh, kind of creating this full of a head, maybe in the crown, I might go with skip ones and, and shoes. And I think that's yeah. nice that you can actually do that on the robot. We're actually kind of selecting, um, you know, the best hairs uh, that, you, that you're going to um, choose for the case. You don't have to worry about the over harvesting component. You don't have to worry about these obvious, you know, hair patterns where. You know, I, I go as short. My hair's a little bit, I was really long, I have a little ponytail, sorry. But it, it's, I go pretty short on my side sometimes when I cut it. And um, even at a one guard, you cannot see that I've had, um, you know, hair harvested, you know, before. Um, so is there an AI component to this? So is this robot getting smarter every time I'm using it? Um, you know, is it getting smarter from 2021? Is it smarter than from 2020? Um, is every user's data going in there and making it smarter? What's happening with that AI component? So I'm always yeah, yeah. Saying. So, so you touched a bit on the um, on the hair selection, uh, for example, with the F ones, F twos. So uh, we have worked with physicians uh, to train our algorithms. It's physician trained algorithms to basically select the hair 
and uh, and get the hair properties. So um, that part of the of the system is uh, is definitely AI driven. And then of course any of the changes to the param these are intelligent par parameters that we have. So anytime uh, the uh, you as a physician you want to make an adjustment, well it takes some uh, uh, a little bit of adjustments from the system to 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 reach that parameter. So there is that feedback always uh, uh, in there. Um, we do have capability to do uh, uh, self-learning. Um, this is uh, one area that we closely monitor, especially for safety and regulatory. So it's a, it's a big topic right now in, uh, in medical fields. So we're taking cautious steps there, uh, but uh, definitely we are incorporating uh, the latest, uh, basically data-driven techniques uh, to uh, help with the surgery. Now, it's interesting because the analogy a lot of people compare um, artists to is Tesla. And I have, I actually have two Teslas, love Tesla. Um, but the autopilot component, um, they call it autopilot. It's a really complex. And I think that this analogy of comparing robotic hair transplant right. and um, autopilot in a car are completely different. Because if there's something that's specifically designed and purposely and probably the best um, possible scenario for using robotic hair transplant and AI, it's going to be harvesting hair from the back of the head because once you have hair consistent and you can make hair black, you can just dye it if someone has blonde hair or white hair. Um, you essentially have very few parameters that have to be changed that much. It's just, can you manually dexterously change this and kind of identify what it wants to identify and which the robot does amazingly. So Tesla, on the other hand, I love Tesla. Again, I own two of them. I'm trying to put them down, but to drive on autopilot, it has so many things it's looking at that occasionally it's not going to do what it wants to do. So I have lots of issues with my Tesla autopilot. I wouldn't trust it to do anything. Again, I'm not gonna fall asleep in my Tesla. I'm not gonna fall asleep with the artist, but at least I know that this is, um, it needs very little adjustment afterwards. I mean, it's, it's just so honed in. Yeah, yeah, and you're definitely touching, and you know, Tesla's uh, Tesla's autopilot is is is, is amazing, amazing uh, piece of technology, right? And uh, you know, in the medical field, um, we have the same scrutiny, maybe even a, a bit more, uh, uh, when we are to apply these uh, new methods that are are very um, uh, hotly uh, discussed and and uh, pushed right now uh, from the artificial intelligence. Okay, so I want to jump into the some myths of um, artists. So I'm going to bring up a myth. I, I know some of these answers, okay, but I'm going to bring up things that patients bring up. Or if I look on the web, um, as you know, the web is full of information. Um, some of it's super accurate, and some of it, you know, um, might not be real, real news. Um, okay, so first question I get from the first question I, I see out there is the artist is slow. And the artist can harvest, it's slower than a human and can only harvest, I've seen anywhere from 100 to 200 hairs per hour. Um, your thoughts on that statement? We're gonna go dive into all these things, but first we'll go with artist speed. Augie? Yeah, so um, so artist speed, um, so or the speed of transplantation, we, we usually look at the two two. two so we'll go with harvesting first. Yeah, yeah, harvesting first instead of uh, implanting. Yeah, first. yeah. So for uh, harvesting, right? So there is a total amount of time that the patient stays um, uh, in a chair, you know, including the breaks and all the setup. So that's the clinical speed, and you know that has to be taken into into account. Um, because there is some preparation uh, of the instruments, uh, the, the robot needs to start up uh, um, and the uh, uh, patient may take breaks. So we call that a clinical speed. And then there is a robotic speed, which is the speed of extraction. Once everything is in place, the tensioner is there, you know, what is the speed of uh, which the system can extract? So um, our requirement for our system is to extract at 600 graphs or higher. Um, clinically, like with everything included, and then robotically uh, over a thousand. Okay, so uh, that way um, now uh, there are teams, uh, harvesting teams that are really well trained. They, they 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 work well together and they work well with the with the robotic system. And you know, patient is compliant. They know how to uh, how to uh, prepare and and deal with the patient. Um, some, some teams can reach speeds of 1,000, over 1,000 clinically and over 2,000 robotically too. So it, a lot also depends on the users and also on the patients as well and how they handle uh, being in the chair and you know, how, how you treat the patient comfort. 
um, and you know, are they um, uh, uh, are they relax? Are patients relaxed? So, so those are some of the external components to the system uh, that influence the speed. Okay, so let's just emphasize that number because it's going to make it super clear. The yeah. fastest speed you can do an hour is two thousand, and I think on the nine X it was about twelve fifty. So that's noticeably improved as far as speed. Um, if you're doing this by hand as a frame of reference you're looking at chair time of at least five hours for 2000 graphs. And I can paint this room behind us in about five minutes, but guess what? If I paint it in five minutes, how's it gonna look? <laughs> it's not gonna look good. So speed isn't, it's not just fast, it's accurate and fast, which is super cool. critical. So you see some people who are doing things fast by hand, maybe they're doing 500 graphs, maybe, but how many of those are again, are gonna be teed, transected, have this inconsistency issues? You're talking 2,000 exquisite graphs. So that's there's no not, no other technology that comes even close to that. That's amazing. And at my record, I think, is about 1350. I mean, we look that up, maybe 1350, 1450. And that's just us kind of working with that. Again, I, I wish I could get to 2,000, but you know, 1350, 1450 is where we're at with, with artists. Um, another question that comes up. Um, the artist punch is ginormous. I'm going to have holes in the back of my head that are ginormous. And with our handheld FUE, it's a micro punch and you won't even see any scarring. Augie? So um, we have, we are follow, our punches are, are following the industry standards, right? So our most commonly used punch is um, uh, 19 gauge. That's uh, 0 .0, uh, 0 0.9. Um, we have also 18 gauge, which is one millimeter. At, at some point, actually, uh, with the 9X, we even had a 20 gauge, which is 0 0.8 millimeter punch too. Um, so, so we closely uh, follow the standards uh, that are set. Um, and um, one thing that we found, I want to talk a little bit about the 20 gauge or 0 0.8 millimeter punch, is um, that uh, we had that available. Um, however, we did not see, uh, even the doctors were talking a lot about it, we didn't get to receive too many orders uh, of this punch because uh, probably uh, because uh, when you use a very thin punch, what happens is that uh, you don't have, you get less and less supportive tissue around the follicle. And uh, in the end, uh, lots of doctors uh, uh, did not, do, do not prefer that. They would prefer to have some supporting tissue. Uh, that's why, uh, but we have even made that very, very uh, thin punch, uh, fully tested, released, uh, and uh, packaged into kits. Uh, however, um, our most used punch is 19 gauge and then 18 gauge as well. Yeah, so let, let's kind of break this down for our audience so they understand what we're dealing with. Yeah. So a hair is about 0.6, a single hair. If you go to a double, triple, um, quadruple hair, you're going to be around 0.8 millimeters with no buffer around. So it does not make sense, in my opinion, clinically, to be using a 0 0.8, um, you know, 0.8 millimeter punch. There's, it's just not, you're just not putting the buffer zone. And even though you can make this smaller, the, 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 the problem with that is that you're going to be having issues with hair viability, which is the whole point of this. And, and what you mentioned earlier is what is the, um, the upside of doing this, uh, how big of a punch can you make before you get scarring? They've actually looked at this parameter and less than 1.5 millimeters actually does not lead to scarring. For us, I think I like anywhere from a 0 0.9 is where I, is my sweet spot for, for artists. Uh, seems to be enough of a uh, room and, and comfort around the graph. Um, and a lot of my patients, uh, just like me, have different ethnicities and they might have, I'm um, half Indian, half Italian. So a lot of my hairs are fours. Sometimes I get fives. And there's no way you're going to harvest a five hair graft with uh, a 0.8 punch. It's not going to happen. So you need to have a 0.9 to get those safely and have that kind of tissue around it. So clinically, um, I think that it's a marketing thing that some offices look at. And if they're actually using those punches, I bet you your data would support that it actually leads to less favorable results. Is that true? That using a really small punch versus a 0.8 or a 0.9, a 0.9 or, or um, you know, uh, around there would lead to more favorable results. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. And um, um, I do want to point out that uh, our uh, punch, the Ultra Punch, um, uh, follows the standards of uh, having the cutting edge uh, being on the outside uh, and then on the uh, inside, it's duller, it's kind of like a funnel. 
Um, so what that does is um, actually as the follicle is being dissected, it's also being squeezed in um, and uh, pushed into the punch. So that's also um, um, uh, another, another reason uh, why uh, changing of the size uh, can, uh, you have to be looking really carefully when somebody talks about what is the punch size and what's the punch diameter. You know, what, what are they talking about? Are they talking, you know, where is this uh, uh, ultimately the cutting edge of the punch? Another, another myth out there. Um, the, the robot is going to do everything for me. And I want a doctor to design things and, and, and make my stand side. So I want this uh, doctor or surgeon to do this. And I don't want the robot doing everything for me because uh, I don't trust the robot doing everything for me. Uh, thoughts on that? How does that break down that process of a patient getting this done? Is that even possible for someone just to come in and not see a, a surgeon? And, and is, is it possible not to have a team? Um, you know, or is it basically it's, it's, um, let's let's talk about that. Um, sure. Yeah. Even, even done by hand, uh, the physicians have uh, their team of staffers helping out. So with the, with extraction, so the doctor would do the section and then the team would be, uh, doing quality control extraction. So there's always a team involved. Um, of course, and then especially for harvesting, which is, as we mentioned, it's very um, tedious, uh, requires a lot of accuracy, the, do- you know, the doctor gets tired. Um, it doesn't, there is not too much of a, it's more of a mechanical process. There is not too much of a artistry or, you know, that's, it's perfect uh, uh, application of a, of a device or a body device, which can uh, always achieve consistent results. So that's on the harvesting side, it's, it's very clear. Um, in uh, for um, design of sites and implantation where the hair is going to be placed in the front, um, the doctor definitely has the final say uh, of uh, you know what's the proper distribution, um, and you know that can be done by hand. Um, you know, however, we also have our software that lets the doctor exactly define how we, where these areas are going to be. So. Um, there is, uh, it's, it's hard to argue um, that, um, uh, that the doctor uh, or handheld approach is superior uh, to a medical device that went through the whole uh, FDA process and testing and, and all, all, all that. Yeah, and I think that clinical decision-making, I mean, I'm still, like when I'm, I'm transplanting someone's hair, um, you know, whether it's my own, you can see me arguing for 45 minutes with my wife as I'm drawing my hairline. Yeah. I, I'm still, as the surgeon, I'm still deciding where we're harvesting from, how we're harvesting, how we're getting the patient prepared, where we're drawing the hairline, what kind yeah. of design we're coming up. It's definitely a back and forth process with the patient. Um, the advantage I have over a different practice that does not have artists is I can actually have this tool that can make me a reach a level that's superhuman. And anytime you can do that as a patient, you're getting things that are above and beyond what um, human, human capabilities can do. So that's why I think that it's still a very interactive experience with the patient. And we're still around this device and we're still working with you. We're still making sure everything is in check and we're still also kind of guiding this. Uh, so it's definitely a back and forth process. So yeah, that's definitely something that I see that patients are fearful of, of, of this robot to sort of you know, doing everything. Um, Let's talk about a couple of future applications of the robot, if that's okay. And then you know, we'll, we'll just wrap it up. Um, okay, so um, with the robot, um, kind of one of the things you, you touched on earlier was about implantation. So let's talk about that. I have an IX. I have not implanted yet with my IX, which I'm excited about doing, but let's talk about how does that work with implantation? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, you should definitely uh, try it out. Um, and um, for our listeners, so I will try to explain uh, very uh, uh, briefly. So um, the implantation feature builds actually on the older feature that we already had in the in the nine X, which is called the site making. The site making uh, allows the doctor to create, as I mentioned uh, before, the plan uh, how the follicles uh, are going to be distributed in, in the front. What are the densities? What are the angles? And then this treatment plan is then transferred to the system. And then the system can create sites. And now with implantation, it can actually implant. Um, The process of implantation um, uh, is called stick and place. So um, the system automates uh, a well-known handheld procedure, which uh, involves making an incision with a sharp uh, needle um, and then inserting a graft uh, uh, follicle um, using an actuator um, and planting it to exact uh, correct depth. 
Now, these uh, grafts or follicles, they're being stored in cartridges. Uh, and these cartridges are, are 25. Uh, uh, at, uh, you can uh, uh, put 25 grafts at a time. They, they're stored um, in, uh, in a solution uh, after being loaded. So what the system does is, is uh, it goes for one cartridge, one, one graft at a time, implants, and then when the cartridge is complete, then another cartridge is loaded until uh, the whole process is complete. So this is interesting to me because the, the stick in place technique, it's a stick and it's an immediate placement, correct? Um, and correct. so yeah. how long of a delay is it between the stick and the place? Is it like, um, do you know the exact number off the top of your head? It's, uh, uh, it's a minimal. So it's a basically a simultaneous process. As, uh, as the needle is creating the incision, we are already pushing the graft in. And that's one benefit of the stick and place method is that uh, first of all, it's, uh, it has a, a minimal uh, trauma, puts a minimal trauma on the, on the follicle. And in addition, it minimizes uh, bleeding in comparison to um, side making method. So there is uh, once you make an incision, that incision is immediately um, closed with a planted follicle. So there is a much, much less bleeding for the patient uh, when, uh, when you perform stick and place. So, so one thing I noticed with my own hair, because I had my hair done, you know, kind of implanted traditionally, was that day two, day three, day four, I'm getting crusting around my, my grafts. I'm wondering if there's less crusting and less losing around the grafts, and that, that might be one side benefit that patients may observe. I, I don't know if you have enough feedback from your from your. Uh, clinical providers. I don't remember feedback about crusting. We do have a lot of uh, return patients that have been done robotically so far, uh, and we have went through the FDA study. We have uh, excellent uh, results. So, um, but um, um, we we our um, precision again. Every time when we uh, plant the follicle, just like with harvesting, we can um, uh, exactly specify the depth at which we want to plant. So the doctor can plant in maybe uh, exactly like one millimeter uh, above the skin, maybe at the skin. So, so those are some of the, again, important parameters that uh, will um, result in, a, in, in uh, they will uh, make it a good result at the end, right? Yeah, so I'm super excited about that. So I'm super excited to get that going in, in my practice with that. And, um, you know, so um, uh, future advances for the robot, um, so the tensioner right now, so for those of you that have that, why is the tensioner one size? Could you make the tensioner the whole size of the head or would that be too, uh, it wouldn't work yeah. that way? Yeah, that's how we started. However, that's not very comfortable for patients. So if you have a huge tensioner, so um, then um, you have to put a lot of force in order to get, if, you, if you're trying to stretch the whole back of the head, so in order to get that good tension in the middle, you have to put a lot of force. Um, and that, that pre pretty much pins down the, the patient down, you know, they don't feel very comfortable. Um, so that's, that's one disadvantage of, of having a big, uh, big tensioner. And then another disadvantage is that, um, let's say if you're going uh, um, closer to the ear, some, like, like if you start going to this area, it's kind of hard to maneuver with the large, uh, with a huge tensioner. Um, so, um, so for now, what we have done, and I want to point out that our X tensioner is 30% uh, larger uh, than our original tensioner, which allows for about uh, a harvesting of 150 graphs, um, uh, which which is a significant improvement from uh, uh, from before. Where, where do you see um, the artist IX going? Where do you see it taking um, the artist uh, platform and the experience for patients in, in the next few years? So um, for our um, quality is already of harvesting graphs for the, for the patient is already very high. So, so the improvements will be on the workflow and the ease of use. Um, you know, one feature that uh, we are closely uh, looking at and uh, researching is the uh, outer extraction. Um, so our extraction is a, is a feature where uh, after the, the section is complete, um, then uh, the system would uh, pull up um, graft, pull up the follicles, inspect them, sort them, and prepare them for implantation. So that's, uh, that's one uh, area of uh, research for us for hair transplant. Amazing. And so for me, looking at this as a, both a hair surgeon and as a hair patient, um, I think uh, when I see uh, patients thinking about what uh, process or thing to get, 
Um, if you're going to do your hair, you have a limited number of hairs to harvest in your lifetime. If you're going to do it, value each hair, value each hair, make sure that each, each hair is being treated properly and, uh, you know, use a device. And I think surgeons who don't have an artist, I think the one reason they don't have an artist, the consistent thing I hear from them is it just costs a lot. But that being said, if I want a Tesla, guess what? It costs a lot. So if you want like a world technology, you need to have a world technology in your office. It's so worth it for the patient. So for patients thinking about this saying, well, yeah, um, I, don't, I don't think patients see that much of a difference in artist doctors versus non-artist doctors, but there's definitely a difference in quality. And for surgeons, well, yeah, I, I get it. If you don't want to spend money on technology and all that, I, I don't want to spend uh, uh, money on something, but if it's such a huge advantage for my patients and it's going to offer them better quality, why would I not? I have to do that. That's my, that's my obligation as a doctor to give them the best treatments they can get. So it's a no brainer with artists versus something, you know, something else. Um, Augie, thank you so much for joining me on a late night. I know it's you're, you're working hard at developing all these technologies that I, I just get to play with. Um, fascinating, always fascinating to talk to you about everything. Um, hopefully we can chat again soon. Okay. Okay. Anytime, Dr. Shah. Thank you.